Hello, and welcome to our first installment of Ivy Film Festival's brand new digital speaker series. Um, my name is Nora Graham. I'm a senior at Brown, and I'm one of the co-directors of Ivy Film Festival. Uh, and I'm here today with Eliza Hittman. Um, Eliza, <laughs> Eliza is an award-winning filmmaker born and based in Brooklyn, New York. Her latest film, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, premiered at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival, where it received a special jury prize and had its international premiere and competition at the Berlin Film Festival, where it won the Silver Bear Award. Never Rarely, Sometimes Always is now available for churches digitally, and it is frankly unmissable. Uh, Beach Rats, her second feature film, premiered at the 2017 Sundance Film Festival, where she won the directing award. It was a New York Times critic's pick, just like her micro-budget feature film, It Felt Like Love, which premiered at Sundance in 2013. She earned an MFA from California Institute of the Arts and is currently an assistant professor of film and video at Pratt Institute. She is the recipient of the Emerging Artist Award from Lincoln Center and a 2018 Guggenheim Fellow. Eliza, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Hello, thank you for inviting me. Um, I would love to start by talking about Planned Parenthood. Um, as I'm sure everyone knows, never really, sometimes always, is the story of a young girl traveling to New York to acquire an abortion. You did an incredible amount of research for the film, most of it hands-on, you actually going to clinics, speaking with counselors. And I'm curious with our current global crisis um, and reproductive health facing more obstacles than usual. You know, I'm speaking to you from Texas where it was uh, deemed not essential for several mm -hmm. weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> why do you think it is especially important to pay attention to Planned Parenthood's mission? Um, yeah, I was I was really fortunate in the research and development of the film um, to have access to Planned Parenthood and um, that they are so eager to work with artists and filmmakers um, because they, you know, they know that, you know, film is a tool for communication and, you know, can be a um, resource for advocacy. Um, and they were available, you know, to consult on the film. And I met with social workers and I toured different facilities and I eventually sort of earned their trust enough, you know, to be able to shoot at two Planned Parenthoods, um, one in Brooklyn and one in Manhattan. Um, and, you know, I think I, I used them a lot as a sounding board through the development of the film. And anytime I had questions or roadblocks in my writing, I would always kind of come back to my notes or get on another call and, can, you know, ask them questions. And, you know, I was specifically looking at okay. the barriers that a minor encounters. Oops, sorry. Um, and um, specific to the state of Pennsylvania. Um, you know, I think it's really, you know, unfortunate the situation that we're in at the moment. And I think that Planned Parenthood um, has been, you know, an important force behind, you know, sort of battling um, this idea that, you know, abortion and reproductive care is not essential. And obviously in the middle of a global pandemic, we need more access to healthcare, not less. Um, so they're just, you know, I think pushing back on a lot of, you know, politicians' agendas and trying to shutter the doors of, you know, essential clinics that help women. Absolutely. And I know you've been thinking about this concept since 2013 and the death of Savita Halepinavar, mm -hmm. um, who was denied an abortion in Ireland. And I'm curious just that seven year mm -hmm. from between now and then and how everything, the issues around reproductive health have still persisted. What is it like now to release it into this historical moment, especially as you've been talking about with the American healthcare system? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you yeah, know, the, the film, um, it really kind of was inside me for a long time. And I started, you know, the project in 2012 and thinking a lot, you know, specifically about the journey that women would take from Ireland to London um, via ferry and then back, you know, and to London and for an abortion and then back within the course of 24 hours. Um, and I really you know, thought it was an untold story and a hero's journey. And I asked myself, like, what's the American equivalent of that narrative? Because I'm obviously not a UK filmmaker. 
um, and, you know, really thought about the journey that women take from rural areas into urban areas. And, um, you know, obviously we were intending on having a theatrical release, but right when the film opened, you know, the, you know, theaters, you know, shuttered and um, we pivoted to a VOD strategy. Um, and you know, my hope is that, you know, because of everything, you know, that's happening in this country, you know, that vulnerable young people have access to the film who might find themselves in similar circumstances to the character in the film. Um, and, you know, we've been working also with Planned Parenthood and doing, you know, grassroots virtual screenings in places like Texas to, um, you know, help screen the film and also facilitate a dialogue about, you know, the current restrictions. And I mean, with that, I wanted to talk about your journey as a filmmaker and kind of what led up to you going from your previous films to this one, your, you know, your earlier feature films felt like Love and Beach Rats mm -hmm. are also in kind of how young people react to and deal with trauma, taboo, sex, and how do you see Never Really Sometimes Always in relation to your earlier work? I think, it, you know, it's obviously thematically very similar um, and deals with um, issues around, you know, teen trauma and identity um, and these sort of transformational events and moments in young people's lives. Um, and, um, you know, I think that the characters are similar but different. They're all kind of inarticulate and struggling to, to deal, to, to talk about painful subjects or issues that are deeply like stigmatized um, and that's sort of a running thread between all of my films. I think they're a little bit different. Um, I think you know and it felt like love and in Beach Rats the characters are much more self-destructive and nihilistic maybe and um, in a way uh, never rarely sometimes always the journey of the character takes is different because it's um it's a liberating journey in a way, and it's about her having, you know, agency over her body um, and essentially, yeah, you know, just sort of finding her way out of, of a crisis for the moment, whereas my other characters are kind of digging themselves deeper. Absolutely. And I mean, there's rarely a tangible, obvious antagonist in your film. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Sometimes the characters are their own antagonists. Um, and I think Never Really Sometimes Always is so powerful because what piles up against Autumn are these obstacles to get a perfectly legal mm -hmm. abortion. Mm -hmm. um, yet you create this incredible internal tension mm -hmm. that you still manages to connect to. And I, I'm curious about how you build that kind of private interior life in your characters while still encouraging empathy with the audience. Mm -hmm. I think um, I think with uh, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, because it sort of follows this hero's journey sort of narrative, um, you know, I was thinking about, you know, how it would be effective without an antagonist. And I was thinking about all the ways in which a world, you know, the world is hostile towards young women. Um, and how to create an antagonistic environment towards her, you know, in a micro sense, but also in a systemic, you know, sense, in a structural sense. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of sort of um, unpalatable, like, male characters that she encounters in her everyday experiences that, you know, kind of violate her in different, you know, sort of small and larger ways. Um, and we're meant to sort of understand, you know, that, that there's, you know, an, un, you know, an unwelcoming climate towards women wherever they are. Um, you know, and I think that the, the inner tension comes from, you know, the, this, you know, watching her navigate these moments, um, but also, you know, knowing you know, in, in finding ways to express exactly what she wants without saying it. Um, and, you know, watching her kind of continuously, you know, jump through hoops or bump into, you know, roadblocks along the way. And I think I, that's something I really admire in how you capture young characters, um, how new and scary the world can seem, but how 
specifically new and scary men can see, even when it's missed with a kind of adolescent desire or curiosity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's this kind of unfortunate process of becoming used to feeling invaded or feeling exploited or objectified. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how you shape films around female characters and LGBTQ characters, especially when it comes to anticipating maybe a predominantly male straight audience who will dismiss them as trivial or mm -hmm. hard to relate to or to connect to. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think in a way, um, you know, I, I'm not so concerned with likability with my characters. Um, and I think that that's alienating for some, for some audiences that they defy stereotypes. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, with It Felt Like Love, you know, it's about a young woman who really wants to feel desired and that pressure to feel desired and how that sort of, you know, makes her the aggressor, you know, she, she's just trying to aggressively have an experience that feels, you know, romantic and, um, you know, makes her feel desirable and it pushes her into unlikable places. Um, and I'm not afraid of, you know, showing that side of people. Um, and I think with Beach Rats, um, it, you know, it can be challenging because he's not so likable, you know, and, and um, obviously he does something totally unforgivable in the film, but it is about how, you know, internalized homophobia can build up in an individual and, you know, cause them to do sort of hateful acts. Um, and that's, you know, not, not the narrative that people like necessarily. Um, I think that, you know, never rarely, sometimes always in a way is the most, um, I don't know, she's the most easy character to know out of all of them. Um, Cause I think that the other two characters, people would be embarrassed to relate almost to their actions, if that makes sense. I mean, it's, but it does, and I know you've talked a little bit about mm -hmm. how a lot of people who connect with your young characters are often early twenties college having mm -hmm. that kind of distance mm -hmm. from it in order to be like, I remember when I felt like that and how awful it was to feel like that. And, you focus, so I mean, uh, throughout your career on these single protagonists and we rarely ever leave their side. We see mm -hmm. them through them. And I, I guess, I, why would you say that is? Why do you mm -hmm. find specifically in really settling in on a character mm -hmm. like, through moments that maybe other filmmakers would say were mundane mm -hmm. or anything like that? Um, you know, I think that I, my goal is to always create a, like a, a, an immersive subjective narrative where, you know, the audience is very much, you know, aligned with the character through their everyday kind of struggles and pain. And, um, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm less concerned, you know, with presenting an objective story um, more than I, you know, want to connect the audiences with this one character. So it's really, you know, a rigorous exercise in subjectivity and, you know, in that subjectivity, you know, wanting the audience to see what the character sees and feel what they feel and um, learn about their world and the story as they experience it. Um, and I think in that subjective gaze, you know, it gives me permission um, to, you know, look at small moments that you know, um, we as individuals take in about the world, um, you know, and, you know, the way people's bodies interact and, um, you know, details, you know, about our environment, if that makes sense. Um, and I, you know, it doesn't, I'm not concerned with them seeming mundane. I'm just kind of concerned with them seeming sort of true to the way that we, navigate and see our world. And I think we actually have an audience question that touches mm -hmm. on just that. Um, Ethan Valdez, who's a junior at Brown, says something I really admire about your films is how much you are able to convey through your character silence. Mm -hmm. And element there, never really, sometimes always, is the power of small physical gestures of comfort mm -hmm. with the counselor in Autumn, for instance, but also those invasive charged moments of the men on the film, even just brushing their hand against mm -hmm. the 
And oftentimes these quiet moments say more than dialogue ever could. And he is wondering how you approach this. How does it come out of your scripts and how does it mm -hmm. translate into your direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, a lot of times in the writing process, you know, I do a first draft. And the first draft is usually sort of just putting down the story as I see it in my head. And sometimes there is a tendency to rely on dialogue in that first draft um, to just get the story out. And I'm aware of that tendency and that potential. So the, the drafts that I do after that um, tend to, you know, think about and consider subjectivity. Like, am I seeing this scene through the character or did I just write it, you know, objectively? Um, am I sitting with the character in her seat in this restaurant, you know, after this talent show, or am I just putting down the dramatic beats of the scene, you know, and I kind of go back and force myself to see it through the eyes of the character. Um, and then, you know, the, the next draft for me is really to consider, you know, details and behavior. Um, so you know, for example, like I never want, you know, how do I show how the character feels about being pregnant if she's, you know, if I never want her to say I'm pregnant. Um, and so, you know, originally in the script, I had her kind of come home from the pregnancy center and dye her hair because I was just looking for a gesture, you know, that showed she was, you know, an action, a behavior that showed she was processing what had happened but that she was taking a you know taking control of her body um and you know just looking for ways to you know show and not tell um but through behavior and action um you know with the moment on the bus and the detail of the hand like that was scripted that way like you know i, I wouldn't say close up you know he taps her arm but, you know, you know, it does like on a new line, say, you know, a stranger's hand taps Skylar. And it's, you know, I know that I'm highlighting that small moment, which I'll then shoot in, you know, a close, you know, extreme close up, slightly off speed, because it was all about somebody kind of rupturing the privacy of their world. And that's why that moment you know, was important to me because he was allowing him, to, you know, his priv you know, there was a sense of entitlement, like he can touch her and the gesture would be perceived as flirtatious or romantic. Um, but that's that small detail of her, you know, of him touching her was something that probably came in a later draft, you know, that I was trying to sort of find ways to show him invading their space. Um, but yeah, I think it's like for me about one, you know, first draft of story and then subjectivity and then sort of details. And, you know, I think when you kind of begin shooting films, you just sort of think of these in these sort of standard shot sizes and, um, you know, the way that our eyes roam around the world, you know, is not in these shot sizes. Um, and you know, I try and really capture the way, you know, your eye naturally looks at other people's bodies and, um, you know, these other moments, you know, that have sort of significance, you know, throughout the narrative. Absolutely. And, and building off of that, we do have another question about your writing process. Yeah. A lot of our audience are aspiring screenwriters, yeah. screenwriters trying to figure out if they want to be both, if they want to be uh -huh. one. On. I'm um, happy to answer all of them. <laughs> um, both uh, Nathaniel Coughlin, who is a senior at Brown, is actually uh, runs our screenplay department at Ivy Film Festival, and Annabelle Atanasio, who is one of our 2020 jury judges and acclaimed director of last year's Mickey and the Bear, um, asked questions about your process with writing um, and how that translates into directing. Uh, and what would you say in a screenplay makes it more easy or difficult to prepare for when you start to visualize as a director? Or does it come in those stages? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I write a screenplay um, really trying to tell a good story. And I don't put any camera directions in at all. Um, so it's exclusively what the camera sees and not what the camera does. 
Um, and I never want the kind of direct, I never want to direct on the page because I just want it to read like a fluid story um, for a general audience, you know, who might be interested in financing the film. Um, but, you know, like I said, I do, you know, try and emphasize details that I know I'm trying to sort of isolate as shots as we shoot. Um, like, um, I'm trying to think of, you know, some certain details, like, you know, during the procedure, the first part of the procedure when they insert the laminaria, you know, it was important for me that the social worker hold her hand because the social worker, you know, told me that she goes in and oftentimes will hold hands with patients, you know, who are scared. Um, you know, so just trying to write in a way that builds up to that moment of realizing, revealing, you know, that she's there and holding her hand. Um, but I, you know, I wouldn't have indicated on the page that the dolly is, you know, tracking along the table, but just trying to elegantly find a way to say, you know, Autumn lies on the table, her legs are spread, she's vulnerable, she's scared. Um, as they begin to insert the laminaria, her body clenches, you know, she clenches up, um, she squeezes her hand, um, you know, she squeezes the social worker's hand. So in a way, we're kind of building to that image, in a way, um, in how it's written versus talking about the camera movement, so that there's like a flow of imagery on the page, if that makes sense. Absolutely, and then just all the talk about subjectivity and just mm -hmm. how well you manage to capture, you know, the things that are very hard to kind of face and talk about when you are a young person. I know that Never Really Sometimes Always won the U.S. Dramatic Special Jury Award for Neorealism. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you know, what you think about realism in your process or mm -hmm. subjectivity if it comes through that, because again, oftentimes people leave your film saying that felt so real, that felt mm -hmm. so real. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do think that there's um, validity in call, you know, in, in, in saying that the film comes from a certain tradition. Um, and I do think I gravitate, you know, to, you know, films that feel, you know, grounded in, in, our, in our real world and our real experiences. Um, you know, I think like authenticity and realism, you know, it's all about what feels me real to me as a director. Um, and um, I don't know, it's funny, you know, I think sometimes I throw people off, like just for example, like when I was casting Beach Rats, you know, initially we were casting kids, you know, we're looking for kids in real parks and, um, you know, then all of a sudden I threw a curveball and I cast this British kid to be the lead in the film and it really like um, shocked people because it felt like such a an abandonment of like the kind of realism that I was striving for um, but it you know ultimately his performance felt the most um, emotionally authentic to me um, and that was why he was the best for the role so I you know I don't have like you know, kind of strict, like the strict criteria for like what makes one of my films feel real. Um, and I think that first and foremost, I strive for, you know, an emotional um, uh, authenticity and credibility. Um, More than like a, the construction of the world and, um, you know, I think obviously like realism, you know, that tradition of realism, you know, is about sort of poor people up against structural and, you know, systemic barriers. Um, just going off of, again, kind of the influences and um, the tradition you feel like you belong to, another student question we have from Alyssa Lara, who is a sophomore at Emerson College, um, she wants to know a film that moved you recently and a film that moved you when you were younger? Um, let's see, what, did, what moved me recently? Uh, last night I watched um, an Alan Clark film called Christine that is on YouTube. 
um, that I recommend you find. And it's all about just this girl in the suburbs um, and her daily routine of selling heroin and doing heroin. Um, and it's a very unromantic um, look at drug addiction um, and a very, you know, in a very mundane suburban environment. Um, and I, I thought it was really incredible and um, sort of in the, you know, in the style of a lot of Alan Clark's films um, that I like a lot. And I'd never seen this before and we discovered it on YouTube. And I think it's part of like a, a UK series called Screenplay um, that I recommend. Um, other movies I liked recently, I really liked um, Matty Diop's Atlantics. Um, I'm playing catch up, you know, because I've been working on a film and teaching and um, just sort of slowly switching back into um, film watching mode. Um, a film that I, that I really loved from childhood. Um, tricky, I'm not sure I, I can come up with something offhand. Very fair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess our, our last audience question is from Lexi King, who's a junior at Brown, who's our, in a, also in our screenplay department. And Lexi was hoping if you could shed some light on what the process of becoming a director is like, just mm -hmm. on a very practical level, what mm -hmm. types of steps do you have to take in order to pursue mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. um, I will, I will, I would say I had, you know, no overnight success. Um, and my career I've built very gradually and being very uncompromising and, um, you know, also working in academia and teaching and, um, you know, not really making a living off of filmmaking, I have to say, you know, now I, I, now I can say that I can do that confidently. Um, but, you know, it took, it took a while. Um, I think, you know, for me, what I think was important, you know, was that I made one short film in graduate school that had some recognition that told me um, I was ready to move on from short filmmaking. Um, and I never, I don't know, I didn't have a lot of attention, like after I made my short film that played at Sundance, um, I didn't get an agent and a manager off of it. I didn't have like industries, people swirling me. And I really wrote, it felt like love, um, you know, trying to be as practical as possible in the writing of the script. And I wrote it to make it. Um, and I relied on people that I had went to graduate school with to make it and people that I had met in New York. And I made it really on a very micro, micro budget, um, you know, with a crew of like five people. Um, and, um, you know, from there, you know, got a little more support and a little more support and a little more support, but nothing, you know, nothing has been overnight. Um, and, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know what that path looks like, but for me, it's been being, you know, the key to my career has been being really practical, you know, and exploring what I have access to and mining the landscape that I grew up in for stories and places that I could shoot in for free, um, and being active, like in terms of representation, you know, there are no agents and managers really writing me after I made It Felt Like Love. And I went out and found people that I thought, you know, would like the movie who maybe hadn't seen it um, and who I thought would be a good fit for me and actively pursued, you know, you know, support from the industry. And, you know, I think I, I ultimately ended up picking the right people. Um, but, it, you know, for other people, it's much different. You know, for other people, they, you know, the industry comes to them. And for me, it took me a while to kind of, you know, knock on doors and work my way in. Um, and I think, you know, that is often a reality for, for women. 
Absolutely, and I, I see that we're at, at 30 minutes, but if I could just ask you one more question. Yeah, we could do a couple more. I'm happy to, no worries. Thank you so much. Um, you know, we're most, we're first and foremost a platform for student filmmakers mm -hmm. and writers who are just kind of realizing, oh, I could maybe do this if I, mm -hmm. if I tried to, um, but are struggling with, again, those logistical questions of getting funding, writing, mm -hmm. and pitching. Um, and I know you also teach filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I'm wondering, uh, I'm, I'm jealous of your students and I want to know what you tell your students and what advice you have uh, for anyone who might be looking to get involved in the industry in the next decade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think just, you know, a reiteration of what I said, like having one confident short that shows your vision um, as a filmmaker, either as a script, you know, or um, as something that you've actually made. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm an outlier in a way, you know, I've never had, you know, an industry job. Um, I've kind of come around, you know, I've been working like really outside of the system and then building that relationship with the system as I go. But, um, you know, I think, you know, you know, I think you learn a lot, you know, working as a PA, you know, I think you learn a lot working in development if that interests you. Like, I think, you know, there are, I think that there are tracks actually, you know, in the industry for people to follow if that's the way that they want to, you know, sort of enter into it. Um, you know, in terms of like making yourself a writer and director, it's all about making work and not, I think, not being dependent on grants and just like finding kind of DIY ways to do things because I think all those worlds end up being really oversaturated and you could get discouraged. Um, but it's not a reflection of you, it's a reflection of how oversaturated they are. So I think finding a way to be, you know, a total filmmaker and, um, you know, keeping, keeping making work is like ultimately the best avenue. And I guess just from everything that you've learned in, in that rise and in, in the stages you've taken, uh, another big part of our mission is kind of shaping the industry as we want to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's including more female voices, more voices of color, we have a whole international section of our mm -hmm. film that is really important to us. And I guess I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what you think still needs to change about the industry and just be in it what you strides. Mm -hmm. Because again, there's a great strides with DIY, mm -hmm. with the kind of, you know, film mm -hmm. something on your iPhone. What would you still like to see change? I mean, everything. I mean, it's still, it's still a boys club. Um, so, you know, there's, there's an incredible amount of work to be done. And that's, that's the, you know, reality of it. But that said, I, you know, I don't think that should stop anyone from trying to pursue a career because I do think, um, you know, that, you know, your film can have a life through a film festival and be seen. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, that, you know, the gatekeepers are, you know, largely straight white, you know, men. And um, I don't know. I think that I think that there's still ways to make work. Well, I, I guess I just want to finish by saying uh, you have definitely made differences in the industry and, and how people like me think about it, um, seeing your films and seeing what's possible. So thank you again so much for talking to us. It's just been such a pleasure to have you. Um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> okay. Well, thank, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you.